Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm Tony Guerra. You can reach me at TonyThePharmacist at gmail.com. Uh, again, if you have questions about your letters of intent, uh, go ahead and go to residency.teachable.com forward slash P forward slash extreme LOI. What I want to go over today are is a different way of looking at the job market. So the you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with their projections. But a lot of times you can go to the past to see what might come in the future. And what I want to do today is show you how you can look at your own school of pharmacy and their own website and figure out whether or not the grads last year were successful or not successful in getting jobs. I wanted to start with this article that referenced a, a Georgetown study. And the Georgetown study said that some of the pharmacy schools were the best value college when you look at over 40 years, you know, how did people do in terms of how much money they made? And so at the top of these are Albany College of Pharmacy, St. Louis College of Pharmacy, and Mass College of Pharmacy in Boston. So this is above, you know, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stanford, Babson, Harvard, Georgetown itself, uh, and then the Merchant Marine Academy and so forth. Now, what we're saying is, okay, so over 40 years, this is the best return on investment for the amount of money that they put in. Now, the question is, when they did this study, and you would have to look into the details, was this back when you had a bachelor's and you would be paying for a bachelor's degree to earn a pharmacist salary, so you would have even uh, a year less to, to pay and all of that stuff? Um, you know, don't know. But what we want to know now is, all right, well, we've got our three top colleges for return on investment over 40 years. Uh, what does it look like on their web pages in terms of graduation rates, in terms of you know their students getting jobs? Okay. So we start with Albany College of Pharmacy, and you can find that 223 out of the 280 out of the class of 2019 uh, got jobs or continuing their education, and it has a great breakdown here. You know if they're employed. Uh, within the profession of pharmacy, if they're in a residency, they didn't count those the same. Uh, someone who is unplaced or someone who did not respond. Now, the question is, you know, if you didn't respond, would you respond if you didn't get a job? And that, of course, is just pure speculation. But right now we say, okay, well, you know, four out of five students at graduation uh, from the class of 2018-2019 graduated. Now, obviously, things have gone nuts with you know coronavirus and, and all of that but it's reasonable to expect that there's a one in five chance that uh, you're not going to uh, have a placement or you're you're not going to reply to this survey that's actually what it says so let's look at the other ones uh, the next one was uh, mass college of pharmacy let's make sure it's in the same order i think mass college was third so let's put st louis here number two okay and you can look at this and you see it's okay, St. Louis College of Pharmacy, job placement. So graduates employed in the pharmacy profession, including postgraduate education and training, three out of four, 75%. Uh, and then those that uh, pursued graduate edu postgraduate education or residency training, graduates not employed in the pharmacy profession and graduates employment status unknown. And so this is where we get a little bit goofy. So we have 75% plus 18%, plus 1%, plus 24%. Well, it doesn't, you don't have to know pharmacy calculations to see that that doesn't exactly add up to 100%. So my thinking is that this 18% is a subset of this 75. So they're saying that of the 75 who got jobs, we're being transparent, that someone who pursued graduate education or residency was about 18% of that group. And, then, and it's about 20, somewhere around 25% nationwide, uh, if you look at it. And this is the class of 2019, so two years ago. And then graduate employment status unknown. And we're going to see that this is kind of a common theme. So in the first one, we have 20%. We can't find them. Here we have 24%. We can't find them. And let's move on to number three. So again, this is the Georgetown study and puts Mass College of Pharmacy number three. So here is uh, Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences graduating uh, 298 students. <laughs> That's so many. 
Uh, and I think this is 2019 because it says first time pass rate on 2019 Netflix, 84%. Uh, and we're not talking about that right now. Uh, on time graduation rate, 84%. And then 18% are in postgraduate training. And then 63% are employed at graduation. Now, this is where it really doesn't help us because we don't know what this means. Does this mean A, 26.3% are not employed at graduation? Or does this mean 26.3% minus 18% are employed at graduation? And again, this is something you would have to contact your dean or contact them uh, to clarify this. But I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Obviously, uh, the one that's more consistent with what we've seen, 20% not answering, 25% uh, that didn't have employment at graduation, and 26.3% uh, that doesn't, that's about par for the course where four out of five will have jobs and one out of five won't. Now, this is the problem is that just like when people are going into college, although only 50% will finish their degree, something over like 85% believe they will finish their degree. So while one out of five will not have a job at graduation, I believe that everyone believes they will have a job at graduation. And that's something that's kind of hard to kind of process. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get through the Big Ten. But I just wanted to show you that you have to actually ask your administrator and say, hey, you know what, how did the graduates do last year in getting a job? It's, you know, the new year, getting ready to apply. I just wanted to see, you know, how aggressive my search needs to be. Uh, do I need to be looking at different states and things like that? And that's why I included this next one, uh, which is in the Pac-12 or Pac-14. I don't know how many. I think it's Pac-12. Uh, so Washington State University. Uh, now we're at the, the 2020 graduates. So 81 percent. Um, it's this is a little bit misleading in the way it says it of 2020 graduates actively looking, accepted a job, residency, fellowship, or had a pending offer. And I think what they're saying is that we're still consistent with that 19% that really doesn't have uh, that secured employment at graduation. Because when you get the breakdown here, you see that based on a survey, data represents percentages out of 104 class of 2020 graduates who secured residencies, fellowships, jobs, or offers of employment. So the breakdown is here, uh, just like before. But we can see that we're not having a lot of consistency. And this is something that's really a concern because as I'm coming into the new year and saying, I want to get a job in this pharmacy market, you know, what, what's going on with the alumni? How, how did they do last year? Okay, and we're seeing different things. Uh, this residency thing is something that you'll see that's very common, that you'll see adjoining states. So Washington's up here. So you've got Oregon, California, Idaho, and Montana. Okay. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't tell you, give you any way of knowing, like, is it a lot that went to California? Did most go to Washington and so forth? That would actually be a little more useful. But you can see that maybe somebody had some ties to Wisconsin, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Jersey. Uh, let's see. I always get Tennessee and Kentucky mixed up. This is Tennessee. Uh, then Texas. And then that's bad. I know this is Missouri. <laughs> this is Oklahoma. Goodness gracious, my geography is terrible. This is going to be, so I'm, I'm going through the Southeastern Conference, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. How am I blanking on a state? We just did this. This is really bad. Okay. United States map. I'm so embarrassed. This is really bad. We're human. Okay. Arkansas. Oh, that's really bad. Okay. All right. Well, the Razorbacks haven't been showing too well in the SEC recently, so I don't feel so bad about that. Um, but uh, my SEC world really was Alabama, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida, and LSU to some extent. Okay. All right, so I apologize to everyone in Arkansas about that. 
Um, but you can see that it's very kind of narrow. So this is something that's really useful because you want to know, all right, well, where did our alumni go? Where are they getting jobs? Because that's a great hint that, oh, that might be a good place for me to go. Okay. Um, I want to show you some other ones that kind of have a different way of doing it. Uh, this is Belmont University that's in, pretty sure it's Tennessee. It's really bad. Okay, Nashville. Yeah. And you see that this is kind of what we expect. 66 graduates. This is 2019 numbers, though. Uh, but 66 graduates, uh, 37 in retail, 22 in residency, two in other settings, five unknown. Uh, but this is pretty good. So 92% we know what's happening and something is good going on with those guys. And that's more what we would hope for with a pharmacy degree, not that 20% before. But I'll show you how it gets even more muddled than that. Uh, this is a little bit confusing, Cedarville University, and if you're from there, let me know. I can, uh, you know, update this, certainly. But there is no information on jobs. They graduated. They matched. This is 2019 numbers. They sort of passed the NAPLEX. They've got a class size that's relatively small, and they were happy about their degree. And that usually is the case when you have a mission-based school or a, a Christian-centered school or something like that. But unfortunately, I, I don't see any uh, details about their jobs. So uh, if you go to Cedarville, you would have to contact them, say, hey, you know, I'm getting ready to look for jobs. Just wanted to see where have the alumni landed positions. Okay. But let's look at something that is kind of neat in taking uh, an athletic conference. Uh, obviously, some schools in the athletic conference don't have uh, pharmacy schools, Penn State, uh, Northwestern, and I feel like there was one more uh, in the Big Ten don't have them, but a lot of them do. And I want to show you, you know, how this kind of works out. Uh, this is my home state now, Iowa. And you see that there was a big shift here from employment of 31% in 2019 to 20% in 2020. Now, this is the key here because you're going to see Wisconsin and Iowa cannot, you cannot compare the numbers. And I'll show you why. But this is at graduation. I think this is the fairest to the students because they want to know at graduation, you know, what's going on. So I commend Iowa for being so honest with this. Uh, residency, 44%. I, I know that they have uh, excellent residency matching. Uh, and then, you know, they this undetermined about a third of the class wasn't sure at graduation what was going to happen. And that's getting to the point from that 20% to the 30% where we're like, okay, we might be a little bit concerned and we want to start looking, say, okay, well, where are these Iowa alumni? How can I connect with them? The other thing that you're going to see about Iowa graduates is a lot of them have dual degrees. A lot of them have really good connections. When you look at the Big Ten as a whole, if you go to a Big Ten school, there's a real bond there. And I went to Iowa for like a class. I did some things with the cross country team there. Uh, so I'm a big fan. But we see that um, this undetermined uh, is going to make us a little nervous at graduation that a third of them can't say exactly where they're going. Now they didn't do what Washington State did was, which is, okay, well, it's undetermined because I've got two kind of offers in the works. I'm talking with supervisors, not sure how it's gonna go. Uh, I remember talking to someone last year who got to take a place in, not Sedona, but Sonoma, like wine country. Uh, that was their backup job somehow uh, and didn't, you know, get with something that they at first thought they wanted. Uh, so they just had, you know, that kind of in unsureness at the end. So I'm still not sure what this means, uh, but we're still seeing that between, you know, 20 and 30 percent, that seems to be kind of a common theme that we can't find them or at graduation, uh, they don't have that. Okay, so let's look at my alma mater, Maryland. And uh, again, these are 2019 numbers, so they haven't been updated for 2020. And uh, to be fair, it's incredibly hard if you don't do this at graduation to get this data. 
Now, I still, that's a personal opinion. I think it should happen at graduation. I think you should figure out what they, what the graduate, what the rate is at graduation and what it is six months out, because I think that those two data points tell you a heck of a lot more. Now, again, this is another one of those schools that has a ton of PharmD slash stuff, uh, and you can see their dual degree programs. But we can see that they say still seeking employment or did not respond to survey, and they group them together. And that makes it really hard because you've got 156 graduates, and I know that their uh, class is much smaller, but you're talking about a little less than a third uh, are still seeking employment or did not respond to the survey, and those are two very different things. And so again, because leaving it to after graduation uh, really skews the data, makes it really not very useful, I still think you know we should do this at graduation. But you're looking at a third, which is what we've seen before, that a third will either not respond or uh, have jobs. Uh, Michigan, uh, here we have, I think, 90%. So you're going to see this with the schools that have significant residency program matching. So Michigan is at 59%. And if you want to look at the numbers, the top 10 schools of pharmacy for residency matching send 500 people to residency where the bottom 10 will send 50. And that number is almost exact. So it, they send 10 times more. So you can see that only 10% are um, without their, 10% um, were you know, not sure about their future and 90% were. And, and I think that's, that's kind of what we saw with uh, back there at Belmont, where we were like, okay, that eight to ten percent range, you know, that's a comfortable range. All right, nine out of ten students, they got a job. You know, the other ten, maybe they had things going on, things with spouses, trying to figure out where are they going to be, where should they be. Couldn't make those uh, aggressive moves for looking for a job and things like that. Uh, but you can see something else, which you'll see at Ohio State as well. Eighty percent of graduates were satisfied with their post-graduation employment plans at the time of graduation. They say, oh, 80%, that's not very good. But I would disagree with that. I think that if you look at the whole, I think half of people are not happy with their jobs. And as we're in this kind of tough employment atmosphere, I think having a job in some ways uh, is, is a great thing. Uh, but I think that 80% is actually a, a reasonable amount to say, okay, well, you know, you... you Four out of five of the students went to the school. The school did what they promised they would do. 90% of their students would uh, have employment afterwards. Uh, and then, you know, four out of five liked their jobs. So the majority did, which is, I think, much higher than uh, the average. So, you know, good job, Michigan. Uh, Minnesota, uh, always uh, kind of a leader with uh, those types of things. And you see that the post-graduation rate is at six months. So now we're at a position where we can't compare apples to apples. This placement rate at six months is encouraging to know that, oh, wow, well, if you're at one of the top schools in the a pharmacy in the country like Minnesota is, and you've got one of the top residency match rates in the country like Minnesota does, then maybe those Iowa students and uh, those, what was another one? So the Iowa students... Uh, that are also in the Big Ten are probably placing at 97.5. And, and I would encourage Iowa to take the time to get the data at six months so that we can match apples to apples and say, hey, you know what? Somebody might be looking at this and say, well, should I go to Minnesota or should I go to Iowa? And they might say, wow, you know, a third of the Iowa students at graduation didn't have, you know, job offers or whatever or didn't respond to a survey maybe. And here at Minnesota, oh, wow, you know, only two and a half percent didn't have a job. But again, this is six months later. So we're talking about, you know, let's see, graduate in May. So you're talking about November or December, where almost everyone by the end of the year has a job. So, again, I think it's a little bit unfair that this reporting is not guided by the accreditation document. They don't even actually have to have it there. Uh, they just have to put a couple of things on here. Uh, in a in a group, but that's not one of them. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, let's see. I think this is Nebraska. Okay, 
Uh, and this is the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And you can see here that we've got community, institutional residency, seeking, and you have to look at the order to figure it out. But we can see that it's been consistent. 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020 that 15 percent are seeking at graduation and what this tells me is that if we're talking about five years ago when the job market was a bit better that this number really hasn't changed well that actually tells me that we should expect around 15 percent so somewhere between that eight percent on the very good side to 20 percent or 30 percent on the bad side of students are not going to have employment at graduation, but we're hoping for something over 90%, you know, at the six month mark. But I think this is so important because loans come due after six months. So do we really want six months to be the exact time when students are coming out and saying, oh, all right, well, my loans are coming due. Good thing I got a job. My first check is in two weeks. That's kind of cutting it close. And so what I would encourage you to do is start looking again at your own college first. Say, okay, where are alumni getting jobs? What states are they going to? What jobs are they going to? And how can I follow that model? Because that path is probably a lot easier. Uh, Ohio State has one of the very best of these. Uh, they take so much time in it. Here's the Ohio State University. Um, you have to have the indefinite article or the definite article, the Ohio State University. Okay. Uh, and then we look at their percentages and we see that 17% have been lost to follow up, 5% still seeking, 2% search delayed. And we see that, okay, we'll, we'll add those together, you know, 22%. And we see that's right around that 20%. So we're seeing a trend. And yes, I just kind of picked a bunch of schools. I picked, what, 12 schools or something like that. But we're seeing that there's an expectation that somewhere around four out of five students at graduation will have a job. Now, depending on your situation, we, I think 84% of students have some kind of debt. 16% don't. Is that acceptable to you? Are you in a position where you can just kind of wait until later or not? And this is the real problem. It's a lot easier to get a job right now than it's going to be in January, February, when 1,500 students learn that they didn't get an interview for a residency. And certainly easier than in March when the other 2,500 of that 4,000 find that out. And I rounded those numbers. But there is a flood coming at the end of January of applicants, a half flood, <laughs> and then the full flood coming in March. And you say, well, there's that whole phase two thing, right? Well, phase two, it's four times as many applicants for those residency positions. And a position that might have been a lot easier to get becomes a lot harder. So again, I think we're seeing it again. And uh, there are a lot of uh, these students that do this residency plus masters at Ohio State because I think they have one, pretty sure they have one. Uh, I know Houston has one too. Uh, but this is really what we're looking at is four out of five are going to have jobs at graduation. Uh, Purdue, uh, let's look at that. So they even put a, a salary range here and obviously residency salaries down there, hoping for that uh, big bump as you uh, graduate. But, and they don't have totals here, which makes it a little bit harder. So 60, 70, 105, 111, 114, 124, 132, 135, 145. So out of 145, we have 31, we can do a little Google calculator here. 31 over 145. Oh, where's my slash? Okay. To say 20%. There it is again. And so this also tells you something else. It seems like that whole which pharmacy school is best doesn't seem to be panning out here. With the exception of Minnesota, but we that's six-month numbers. 
we are looking at every school seems to have four out of five getting jobs. And what it seems like employers do is say, we're not as interested in where you went to school. We're interested in how capable you were as part of that school. You know, are you one of the top students at that school? And again, most of these schools are, are some of the top schools. So uh, a little bit tough to, to take the data there. Uh, but I think that that's kind of a, a real something we really have to look at, which is, you know, what what are we doing with those one out of five students? OK, um, this one is uh, Rutgers uh, who and Maryland are new to the Big Ten. Um, so 86 percent of the graduating class who responded uh, secured employment. But here's where it gets goofy is that the response rate was only 48 percent. And so if you've got 48% not responding, that means that half are unaccounted for. Now, it's, it seems crazy that someplace in Jersey that's going to be right next to New York, which is a giant state in terms of, you know, people and jobs and things like that, you know, is going to have, you know, this 50%. And so, again, what we have is a tremendous amount of inconsistency. We have a tremendous kind of disservice in that, well, if we're if half of us are doing it at graduation and half of us are figuring it out six months later, can't we just all do this study at graduation and six months later so that a student can have a reasonable understanding of where they're going to go? Now, this is something you should notice, though, that only 2% started in a hospital and that 16% went on to residency and it could be community residency. But that's just telling you how hard it is to get a hospital job without the residency. At least that's what it says to me. Okay. And then the last one in the Big Ten that I had was uh, Wisconsin. And in big, big bold here, 92% employment within six months of graduation. So consistent with that, you know, 8% that we're seeing. So as we look at this and as we look at the data, and you can look at your data on your college, we're saying, all right. I've got a four out of five chance that I'll probably have some kind of job. What are the things that I need to do to make sure that I'm in the big pile of four out of five rather than the little pile of one out of five? So the first thing is, obviously, if you're applying for residency, that you've not been penny wise and pound foolish. I mentioned this in a previous episode, but you know, for example, I'm basically 95 bucks to help you with a letter of intent and then you, you get access to my course, which of the money that's left over, that's a significant percentage. 100 bucks is a lot of money or $95 is a lot of money. But as a percentage of the quarter of a million dollars you put into this and as a percentage of the bet that you're making, okay, well, I'm just going to do a DIY, do myself letter of intent. I'll do my own CV. I'll just get a couple people to look at it. I'm not sure if they know what they're doing or not, but I'll have that. And then I'm going to bet in a market where only 50% of the people applying for residency get it. And of course, that's completely skewed towards your school. If your school's in the top, it could be up to 90%. And if your school's at the bottom, it could be as low as 15%. But, you know, is that should you be investing a little bit more in, in your CV, in your letter of intent? You know, and obviously, you know, I benefit from, you know, having you work with me, but I don't think if you look at the big picture, the big amount of money you were spending, you know, it's a, a lot of money. Now, this is the other part of that, though, and I understand it. There is an expectation, especially at the small privates, where... Uh, at the small privates, you're going to see a lot more of that kind of one-on-one -on -one than maybe you see at a big research university. You have this expectation like, well, I did pay a quarter of a million dollars, so I'm going to use the people that are here at my college and they're going to help me. Okay, they can help you. And they can help you write a CV and they can help you write a letter of intent. But what they can't do is tell you, hey, I can see that you used phrases from the UCSF letter of intent or the ACCP letter of intent, or that you've got all of these words from someone else and you're going to, one, be thought of as a generic applicant, 
or they may just say, you know, you really didn't say anything. You've, if you've ever talked to someone and they've been talking for 10 minutes but never actually said anything of substance, I keep seeing that over and over again, these kind of global generalizations. I'm going to be a pharmacist at the top of my license. And you have uh, this mentorship, supportive yet nurturing environment or something like that. These gross generalizations are very forgettable and they don't really advance your case, which is what you need to make, which is a rhetorical argument to ethos, pathos, and logos that you are in fact a good match. So you can look at the data and say, all right, well, what you're telling me, Tony, is that at graduation, I got a four out of five chance of getting a job. That's good that that number is probably somewhere between 8 and 30 percent depending on the school of pharmacy i go to okay and that i got a 50 50 shot at residency you know it's not terrible right and then there's things that i can do if i graduate with loans so the world will not end yeah well yes and no i think what happens then at graduation you're one of the one out of five is that, and we've talked about this on with the, the YFP guys, your financial pharmacist guys, that it that monopoly money becomes real money. That that cost of paying back student loans, a couple thousand a month, it's becomes very real. All of a sudden, you're at home, maybe staying with your parents for a couple weeks, and then they're like, wow, this did not go the way that I wanted. And so what I've done is, I'm working to help those 20%. And you say, well, why don't you help the 80%? Well, the 80% is doing just fine. Okay, they're, they're doing okay. But that 20% is a big number. That's 3,000 of our friends that have gone into pharmacy school, trusted the process. Some of them have worked very hard. And for whatever reason, maybe they applied to only four residency sites because that's kind of the cutoff for that first payment. And they decided that I'm going to apply to Cedar sinai Mayo, UNC, and, you know, MD Cancer uh, in Houston. I think it's in Houston. Um, I think I'm butchering that. But, you know, and, and then they're, they're without a job and they were one of the most qualified people. You know, and, that, and that was just a misunderstanding of, of how the process works and what they should have done in terms of, you know, getting a residency. So I'm going to kind of go through this last part of the course. Uh, this one is the residency.teachable.com forward slash P forward slash interview. And what I've done is I've put a bunch of this is the job jobs section, interviewing for community, residency, hospital, uh, academic positions. And you might say academic positions. How could I get an academic position without a uh, residency? And some of the experiential jobs, and there are other jobs that might be available for someone. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a school of pharmacy. Uh, I work at a community college. I love my work and I have plenty of time to spend with my kids and all that good stuff. Uh, there's some mock pharmacy interview questions. Uh, I kind of have an introduction. I talk about culture. Uh, work experience, and then pharmacy-specific interview questions, and kind of go through the whole thing. Um, so, you know, if you're at that point where you're in that 3,000, and I know that right now you're thinking, that's not going to be me, and in your final APPE, it ends up being, oh gosh, that is me, uh, you know, reach out to me at TonyThePharmacist at gmail.com and, and just get my first feedback before you even sign up for a course or send any money to me or anything like that. Just tell me, hey, you know, this is my situation. This is what I thought would happen. This is what happened. Uh, and I can probably give you a bit of guidance. Uh, I can also talk a little bit about uh, the book I wrote, um, Unicorn Jobs for Pharmacists. And what I did in this book was... I put in a number of non-traditional jobs and you can listen to the audio sample for free and it's like $7.50 for the audio book or $10 for the Kindle or $15 if you actually want the paperback. Um, but finding your unicorn job for pharmacists, financial freedom, flexible hours, and personal fulfillment beyond the pharmacy counter. Uh, and this is part of the Pharmacist Residency and Career Series, book six. This is kind of the last one where 
you know, people find their brand, find their passion, find their job. And I think that if you are looking for somewhere to start, if you're just not sure about how things are going and you just really want to just kind of hear what other people have done, some people have gotten clinical positions without residency. Some people have moved on to the financial sector or uh, moved into service sector or other things. Uh, I think this would be a really great, very inexpensive way to kind of start your job search by just saying, okay, let me, let me just kind of get a little bit of encouragement and see what's out there. Okay. All right, well, right now, uh, 1st of January, uh, make sure to reach out for me if you need help with your letter of intent. I will also be helping with career cover letters as those start to come in. Uh, and I'll talk more about that as we kind of go through. Uh, or if you are a PGY2 looking for that first clinical position, uh, I can help with those as well. And what I do again is I really help you with the first one, make sure that first one looks great. So you can on your own uh, probably get a lot of the other ones done uh, by yourself. But some people uh, want me for three or four. Some people hire me for all of them. But I'm here for you, Tony the Pharmacist at gmail.com. I'm happy to help.